Here we will examine the lymphatics related to stomach cancer surgery. However, knowledge of the precise arterial arrangement is necessary first. For orientation, we locate the celiac trunk close to the pancreas head. Note its three main branches, the splenic artery, left gastric artery, and common hepatic artery. The left gastric artery, after giving off a cardial branch, divides into anterior and posterior gastric branches, which run along the lesser curvature. Interestingly, in this specimen, the common hepatic artery divides into four branches, the left and right hepatic branches, gastroduodenal artery, and the right gastric artery. the right gastric artery anastomosis with the left gastric artery at the angular incisure. Moving to the pylorus, we find the supraduodenal arteries, which are distributed to the first superior portion of the duodenum. Back to the left and right branches of the hepatic artery, we see the right branch gives off the cystic artery, which runs over Callow's triangle made up of the liver, the common hepatic duct, and the cystic duct. Reflecting the stomach cranially, we see the division of the gastroduodenal artery into the right gastroduodenal artery and the anterior superior pancreaticoduodenal artery. Tracing the anterior superior pancreatical duodenal artery, we see it meets the anterior inferior pancreatical duodenal artery to form an arterial arcade. The inferior artery originates from the superior mesenteric artery and gives off branches to the initial portion of the jejunum. The superior mesenteric artery is surrounded by an autonomic nerve plexus, by removing these nerves, we can locate the origin of the anterior inferior pancreatical duodenal artery from the superior mesenteric artery. There is another transverse running artery which joins the anterior pancreatical duodenal arcade to form the prepancreatic arcade. Tracing this artery, we find it originates from SMA. Returning the gastroduodenal artery, we find it gives off the posterior superior pancreatical duodenal artery, which runs on the posterior surface of the pancreas head, close to the common bile duct. Moving toward SMA, we find it gives off the common inferior pancreatical duodenal artery, which divides into anterior and posterior branches. Here we follow the posterior branch, and note it meets the corresponding superior branch to form the posterior pancreatical duodenal arcade. Next, we will follow the splenic artery and its branches. Reflecting the stomach upwards, we see the celiac trunk, the common hepatic artery, left gastric artery, and the splenic artery. The splenic artery and vein run together along the upper border of the pancreas. Numerous branches from the splenic artery supply the pancreas. Following the splenic artery, we see that it gives off a branch to the left side of the greater curvature. Note that its branches enter the posterior surface of the stomach rather than the greater curvature. Another artery from the splenic artery enters the posterior surface of the stomach. It is the posterior gastric artery which is distributed near the cardia. Note along the greater curvature, the left and right gastroepiploic arteries appear to meet. Returning the stomach, we see the short gastric arteries supply the fundus. 
Here is another specimen with the stomach reflected upwards with a large tortuous splenic artery. And reflecting the stomach to the right, we find the left inferior phrenic artery, which passes close to the left suprarenal gland and reaches the diaphragm. This artery gives off a branch, called the cardioesophageal artery, which reaches the left side of the cardia. Interestingly, this artery will be significant, we will see later. It serves as a pathway along which efferent lymphatics run from the pericardial nodes. Now we will look at the lymphatics of this region. Looking at the stomach, we see the cardia and the pylorus. The left lobe of the liver has been removed. We see the caudate lobe surrounded by arterial folds. We can insert a finger behind the caudate lobe in the upper recess of the omental bursa and grasp these arterial folds. In the left fold are the left gastric artery and vein, and in the right fold, the common hepatic artery. From the hepatic artery, the right gastric artery originates and returns to the lesser curvature in a recurrent type course. The left gastric artery divides into anterior and posterior branches. The anterior branch gives off a cardial branch and runs along the lesser curvature and communicates with the right gastric artery to form a loop along the lesser curvature. Along the lesser curvature, we see numerous lymph nodes near the left gastric artery. Also lymphatics along the hepatic branch of the vagus communicate with these left gastric nodes. Note this completely independent lymph vessel within the lesser omentum. And additionally, we see lymphatics which run along the left gastric vein. Now, moving to the cardial lymphatics, the pericardial nodes communicate in three different directions. Here we see the right communication with the aforementioned left gastric nodes. Let's look at another direction of cardiac lymphatics passing through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm. Looking at the cardioesophageal region, we see the aforementioned pericardial nodes as well as additional nodes near the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm. We open the hiatus and remove the fatty and connective tissues surrounding the esophagus. We can now see the lymphatics which encircle the lower end of the esophagus. This network includes the pericardial nodes of the rightward communication. We also see another direction of communication with the nodes in the right angle between the esophagus and diaphragm or the posterior diaphragmatic nodes. Now we will look at the third direction of the rightward communication. We reflect the stomach to the right and also reflect the spleen and pancreas body to reveal the splenic artery and vein and the posterior surface of the pancreas body. Note the lymphatics along the splenic artery which cross over the posterior gastric artery to reach the left celiac nodes. Unfortunately, we did not dissect the lymphatics along the posterior gastric artery. Moving to the left inferior phrenic artery and vein, we note the cardioesophageal branch of the left inferior phrenic artery. Returning the cardial region by pulling the stomach, again we see the left group of pericardial nodes. If we trace these lymphatics, we find they descend along the left inferior phrenic vessels.
the lymphatics then convert with the left gastric lymphatics to finally reach the large left celiac nodes behind the splenic vessels at the level of the left renal vein. Now we will look at the greater curvature, where the gastroepiploic vessels form an arterial arch. Along this arch, lymphatics run. Starting from the left gastroepiploic vessels and tracing to the right, we reach the right gastroepiploic artery near the pylorus. Here we see large lymph nodes, the pyloric nodes, which lie just below the pylorus and in front of the pancreas head. Here, from a wider view, we will look at the pyloric nodes. These pyloric nodes hold a significant position. They are located just at the bifurcation of the gastroduodenal artery, where it divides into the right gastroepiploic artery and the anterior superior pancreaticoduodenal artery. These nodes receive lymphatics from not only vessels along the gastroepiploic arteries, but also from vessels on the anterior surface of the pancreas head and from vessels along the second part of the duodenum. Interestingly, from these pyloric nodes, lymph does not flow upwards to the celiac trunk. Rather, it flows downward to the superior mesenteric vessels. Next, we will look at the lymphatics along the hepatic pedicle, which contains the bile duct, portal vein, and hepatic artery. Following the lymphatics along the right gastric artery, we reach the well-developed lymphatic network on the anterior surface of the hepatic pedicle. Some of the lymph drains into nodes along the common hepatic artery. However, some lymphatics run downward and to the right to reach a node situated to the right of the common bile duct. It is the so-called epiploic foramen node. Reflecting the liver and pancreas head, we see the epiploic foramen node connect to the superior retropancreaticoduodenal nodes of Rouvier, which are situated on the posterior surface of the lower end of the hepatic pedicle. These nodes receive numerous lymphatics, not only from the posterior surface of the hepatic pedicle, but also from the posterior surface of the pancreas head. From these Rouvier nodes, lymphatics run proximally, superficial to the nerve plexus, and reach the interaortical caval nodes, just above and below the left renal vein. Note the connection between these interaortical caval nodes on the surface of the left renal vein. Here, the inferior vena cava and the left renal vein have been removed. Note how the lymphatics from SMA convert to a thick lymph vessel which descends obliquely to the right of the aorta. These lymphatics drain into the retrocaval nodes and interaortical caval nodes. Next, we will remove part of the aorta to review the lateral aortic lymphatic chain. 
lymphatics from the right side and from the left side and those along SMA converge at the cisterna chile and form the thoracic duct. The thoracic duct then ascends between the thoracic aorta and the ozygous vein. The basic abdominal lymphatics have been demonstrated. Before observing the celiac plexus, first we will examine the anterior vagus trunk, a parasympathetic component. From the hepatic artery, first the right gastric artery is given off. Then another branch is given off, though not a genuine left gastric artery. Then lower, we find the true left gastric artery directly from the celiac trunk. The branches from the accessory left gastric artery are distributed to the cardioesophageal region. This accessory artery serves as a marker for the hepatic branch of the anterior vagus. At the hiatus of the diaphragm, we can see the anterior vagus trunk. Here with the diaphragm cut from the level of the tracheal bifurcation, you can see plexus formation of the left and right vagus nerves. Moving downwards, we note that the left vagus is the major component of the anterior vagus trunk. However, some branches from the right vagus also contribute to its formation. From the anterior vagus trunk, we now see its hepatic branch. This hepatic branch runs along the accessory left gastric artery and bifurcates into that reaching the porta hepatis and that which descends along the hepatic pedicle to rejoin the hepatic plexus. In this specimen, the anterior gastric branch is not well developed. However, numerous intermediate branches run within the lesser omentum to reach the angular notch and the pyloric region. Now we will observe the posterior vagus trunk, which contributes to the formation of the celiac plexus. The major component of the posterior vagus trunk is the right vagus. However, the left vagus also contributes to its formation. The posterior vagus trunk reaches the area of the left gastric artery. Reflecting the stomach, we see numerous branches distributed to its posterior surface. Here we note a branch which descends along the posterior gastric artery to reach the splenic artery. Tracing another branch of the posterior vagus, the celiac branch, we see it runs behind the hepatic branches of the anterior vagus to reach the left gastric artery near the celiac trunk. This is the parasympathetic component of the celiac plexus. Now we will observe the sympathetic component of the celiac plexus. To trace the sympathetic nerve, we reflect the right portion of the diaphragm medially and downwards. From the thoracic sympathetic chain, a few branches originate to form the greater splanchnic nerve. Where this nerve pierces the diaphragm, a small ganglion is seen. Also, the lesser splanchnic nerve and the sympathetic trunk pierce the diaphragm. In order to observe the right cilia ganglion, we cut the diaphragm. We see the inferior vena cava and the right adrenal gland. We now cut the right superior suprarenal arteries in order to reflect the adrenal gland and view the course of the splanchnic nerve. Returning the gland, numerous suprarenal arterial branches from the inferior phrenic artery are cut in order to view the right celiac ganglion 
which is the termination of the greater splanchnic nerve. The greater splanchnic nerve forms the lateral limb of the right ciliac ganglion. Now we will observe the medial limb of the formation of the ciliac ganglion. With the spleen reflected to the right, we will look at the left ciliac ganglion. As we saw with the right side, the greater splanchnic nerve contributes and also the posterior vagus reaches the ciliac trunk and finally the left ciliac ganglion. Returning to the right side, we see that from the right ciliac ganglion, numerous branches run along the ciliac and superior mesenteric arteries and are distributed to the posterior surface of the pancreas head and bile duct. Also from this ganglion, branches are distributed to the adrenal gland and kidney. Close to these autonomic nerve plexuses, a thick lymph vessel runs. Lymphatics from the above-mentioned area converge to this thick vessel and then drain into the interaortical cable lymph nodes. Here, in a unique view, these structures will be dissected from behind. With the muscles removed and complete laminectomy, the spinal cord is easily viewed. By midsectioning the spinal column longitudinally, the vertebral bodies are viewed. The vertebral column was removed from the surrounding structures. In the upper thoracic area, the esophagus is viewed. And lower, we see the aorta and the ozygous vein, and also the intercostal veins which drain into the ozygous. The right intercostal arteries pass behind the ozygous vein. And even lower, we see the lumbar arteries. The right and left lumbar trunks unite to form the thoracic duct. We cut the intercostal vessels to obtain a better view of the thoracic duct. Following the natural course of the thoracic duct, we note that it shifts from ascending directly behind the esophagus to running along its left margin. In the lumbar region, we observe the abdominal aorta as well as the right and left crura of the diaphragm which surround it. Shifting the aorta slightly, we see the upper border of the aortic hiatus. In the lumbar region, we see the left and right renal arteries and the aorta. Note there is a space between the aorta and the inferior vena cava. This space contains the interaortical caval lymph nodes. Left to the aorta, the lateral aortic lymph nodes are well developed in this specimen and they form a chain. These lymphatics from along the right and left sides of the aorta continue to the lumbar trunks and contribute to the formation of the thoracic duct. Note the various lymphatics as well as the nodes below the left renal artery which drain into the initial portion of the thoracic duct. At the level of the aortic hiatus, the lymphatics arrangement is very complex. 
the left crew of the diaphragm is reflected to review the left renal artery. Interestingly, below the left renal artery, large lateral aortic lymph nodes are seen. Also just above it, more lateral aortic nodes are located. Now, by cutting the left renal artery, more lymphatic connections are revealed. Likewise, on the right side, we cut the rather thin right renal artery, as well as the supranumerary renal artery above it, and that to the adrenal gland, in preparation for the removal of the aorta. Now, with the intercostal vessels removed, we will observe the terminal portion of the thoracic duct. First, we will trace the thoracic duct from the origin upwards. Then, we reach the cervical region, where the duct goes between the left, subclavian, and common carotid arteries. The duct is in close proximity to the vagus nerve and the left vertebral vein. It winds around the internal jugular vein to drain into the left venous angle, which is formed by the union of the internal jugular and subclavian veins. Now, at the upper thoracic level, we longitudinally cut the thoracic duct and open it to reveal a typical valve. Now we will remove the aorta at the level slightly below the aortic arch. We cut the aorta and then reflect it as far as the aortic hiatus of the diaphragm. From the esophageal hiatus to the aortic hiatus, we cut part of the diaphragm to observe the posterior surface of the abdominal esophagus. Now we will cut the celiac trunk as well as the superior mesenteric artery. We can shift the aorta as far as the inferior mesenteric artery. Finally, we cut the aorta just above the inferior mesenteric artery in order to view the intact abdominal lymphatics from behind. Now we will observe celiac plexus formation from behind. Near the celiac trunk and just above the left renal vein, the well-developed celiac plexus can be seen. The right celiac ganglion and right greater splanchnic nerve also reach this plexus. Here we see the posterior surface of the lower esophagus. The posterior vagus trunk bifurcates and enters the corresponding cilia ganglia. By shifting the left renal vein slightly below the superior mesenteric artery, we see pre-aortic lymph nodes. We now cut the left renal vein to the pre-aortic lymphatics. Numerous rather thick lymphatics are connected. These pre-aortic nodes serve as intermediary nodes between the lymphatics from the internal organs and the nodes along the aorta. Lymph nodes surrounding the abdominal aorta, the thoracic duct, and the celiac plexus were dissected from behind.